So, real men wear pink. This is not pink, this is salmon. It's just me and Dimitri the Greek. Where are you, Dimitri? Where are you? Where, where's Dimitri? My brother Dimitri. Where is he? Yes, you said, so far back, bro. We've got to get you Greeks and poor as closer, but I need you closer in case something goes wrong here, my mate. Just you and me, pink, eh? Awesome. Artie Kendall, who's one of our great preachers from this church, sent me this shirt from America. He said, hey, listen, but we need to help you out a bit. Pink shirt. So Artie Kendall, I'm wearing your pink shirt in honor of you. We're looking at the book of Ephesians. It's nice to see you. Um, I did a wedding. You know that I was the only English guy there. The surname of the family was Freken. So I said, welcome to the Freken Trower. It's by lekker, nee. Welkom naar die Freken trouwen. Wel, ik wil net sê die Freken familie saam met ons vandag. En ik wil net sê, Freken, welkom bij ons kerk, my maat. Het <laughs> is baie goed dat jullie hier is. En, um, you don't know this, but um, Mrs. Freken, who's the daughter of Tani Ansu, they, her niece and Tani Ansu's granddaughter got baptized last Sunday night. Her grandpa was kicked out of the church because he believed in baptism. And 20 odd years later, their granddaughter was baptized in that pool. Your niece, your granddaughter, was baptized because her grandpa took a stand for the Bible. 20 years later. We never know what will happen if we make a stand today, what will happen in 20 years' time. We will, we will not know. We will never know. Amen? It's good to see you. Andy Lazovitz and his family chose to be here last week. Only about 12 hours after they were held hostage at the Kaiser home. And Andy and Irene, Andy is a professor. He's just been voted as one of Tiki's top professors, high-performing professor. He was in the top 3% of professors in the whole university. And God has put so much inside of him. And one of the things that is lacking is funding. And so he's got these things that God put inside of him. Because serving God is not preaching. That's just me serving God. Serving God, for some of you, is running a petrol station. For some of you, it's making pies. For other people, it's making coffee. For some of you, it's running modeling agencies. And for Andy, it's to be a professor. And so he's asked God to open a door for him into the nations, into a university that's got much funding because he wants to somehow take the dreams of his heart and of his head and put it into reality and create models that are going to end diseases in the world. And so Andy and Irene have been given an amazing job opportunity in America and uh, so they got hijacked last week. They chose to come here. And um, their visas come, have come through. They leave on the 4th of April. And now they've got to sell their house. And you know this market, it's not easy to sell houses. And the, 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 the stock markets have gone haywire this week. You've seen there's probably been a 10% drop in the stock markets around the world. Interest rates are under pressure. And uh, the world economy is under enormous pressure. This is the message I got from Andy yesterday. If you can just put it up, please. A little story of God's goodness towards us. Our show house broke the Remax record for attendance, 70 people in two and a half hours. We got 11 offers and just accepted one of three that were well in excess of our asking price. Amazing, hey. Say amazing, hey. Amazing, hey. When you serve Jesus, it's amazing, hey. <laughs> 20% higher than the asking price. 20, it's unheard of. Yeah, bro. I said amazing, hey? Yeah, bro. Yeah, bro, it's amazing, hey? So we're serving God together and we're trusting Him for ongoing miracles all over the place. You don't know this on the morning meeting, we have a person who's going through a split in relationship, there's a car involved, there's a balloon payment, there's 20,000 kilometers on a new car, which drops the value, and there's a person in trouble having to make those repayments, and we have a car dealer in our church, so I phoned them, I said, there's a lady who's battling with a balloon car payment, there's a separation, there are no longer funds to pay it, can you help her? He said, yes, I'll give her full price for the car. You see, so signs and wonders, friends, sometimes we think we have to see arms grow. 
Sometimes it's just a car dealer paying full price so that somebody can be released of the burden. Amen? Amen. For this reason, Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 15, see if we can get to the Bible this week. (laughs) If you bought your family last week, I'm so sorry. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, say all the saints. I was reading a story of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, probably the best preacher that's ever been in the world, or certainly the best preacher that's ever come out of England, with Charles Spurgeon. And he was a medical doctor. He was a physician. He was in London. You can imagine every society has got um, structures and classes, and uh, a physician fills the upper echelons of society in London. Highly educated, highly successful, and he got saved. And his first assignment was to go and pass the fishermen in Wales. Now they tell me that in the scale of society in England, the difference between a physician and a fisherman is about six levels of society. The way society works. It's about six rungs down. And so that God takes this great physician and he puts him in Wales with a group of fishermen and he starts to preach that one day he says... I realized that Christ had gripped my heart when I became more comfortable talking to fishermen about Christ than to doctors about medicine. Say all the saints. See, friends, there's no point in us surrendering all and then having dinner parties with everybody who lives in estates and who drives cars like ours and have got their kids in schools like ours. That doesn't, that's not all the saints. Invite people to your table that have different color to you. Invite people to the table who have got a different background to you. Invite people to the table who have got a different social status or financial status to you. And then you will start to understand Christ. Or we can just sit here and sing hallelujah, praise God, thank you Jesus. Or we're going to build a community that is going to reflect scripture. So ask yourself this question, who is around your table and what have you learned from them? Who liked the dog by horses? And we, can, and, and we can go back and forth between estates and between schools and between universities and between qualifications. Or we can take the people six grades below us in the eyes of society and find the comfort in speaking Christ to them rather than the high-level conversations we're having around stock markets. Amen? Amen. Building an authentic community of different kinds of people with equality at the cross of Christ. I have not stopped giving thanks for you, and that's the truth, 3CI. I had the privilege last night of giving thanks for one lady. I get an Afrikaans gedoen. Remembering you in my prayers, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, say Lord Jesus Christ, whenever you read the Bible, the best way to start a text is say, how does God appear in the text? That's the best thing to do. And if you see this text, Lord Jesus Christ, capital L, capital J, capital C, the devil wants to define us by our scars. Jesus wants us to define us by his scars. And I say that again. The devil wants to define us by our scars. Jesus wants to define us by his scars. That means I don't have to drag my history around with me for the rest of my life. Say capital L. Capital J, capital C. The Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, capital F, may give you the Spirit, capital S, of wisdom and revelation. How does God appear in this text? He appears as a Trinitarian God in capital letters. What's your problem? Bring it before the Trinitarian God with capital letters and submit to God. I give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you might know him better. I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. And we spoke about that last week. I just happened to sit last night at a table with a man called Adrian and his wife was Carla. And we just got chatting and on and, and, and this side was Dion who's here this morning. He was work, welcome us at the door. And Adrian and Carla are believers, they, they're part of our community, or they, they watch us online, 
And Adrian did the Munga race, the Munga race. And 900, it's, a, it's, the, it's the cycle race that Clinton and Eugene have done between Bloemfontein and Cape Town. At 900 Ks, he blew. And his knee seized. So he had a choice. Get off his bicycle, put his bicycle away, because he can't go on with one leg, because he's absolutely blown, or he could just carry his bicycle, or he could find his wife, Carla, and say, Carla, I've lost my knee. It's gone. And Carla, who's a lawyer, took leave, got in an airplane, rented a car, and drove next to him with the windows down, with worship music playing, while he rode 300 kilometers with one leg. It's okay. Good. 300 kilometers, and next to him is his wife, who's an unpaid leave, playing worship songs next to him. I have an inheritance in the saints. There are many people in this auditorium that have blown their knees, spiritually, financially. You know what we need? We just need some people to take leave, hire a car, drive next to them with, with worship playing as they hobble along. They hobble along, one leg at a time. The marvelous nature of the inheritance that I share in the saints. And I got into my car and said to my wife, so who gets more blessed? I saw them. I mean, it's unbelievable. So Carla, I hope if you're listening to this, I say, well done. She never took him off his bicycle. She never towed his bicycle. Just like, sometimes We can't rescue people sometimes from the journey of a one-legged race. But we can walk alongside them. And just play music. Amen? The inheritance in the saints. And his incomparably great power. Say great power. Incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is like the working of his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ. Say he exerted. I didn't exert it. He exerted it. Christianity is not meant to be not meant to be like dig deep and like, it's meant to be believing what he did. He exerted. I don't have to. He exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms far above. Say far above. Now say it loudly, far above. Say far above. Put it up there, far above. Put it on the screen, far above. Far above. You didn't do far above. You didn't get my message. Read your messages. Close your eyes and say far above. And ask yourself this question, are you living a far above life? Because that is my position in Christ. It's not exertion. It's not human effort. It's not the ability to run a business. It's our position in Christ. Say far above. You see, just keep your eyes closed. I'm asking you the question. We want to, I want you to pray about it. If people said to me, how would you describe this year for yourself and for the church? I said, I want to live a far above life based on Christ, on the finished work of Christ. Far above. Say far above. above. You see, friends, too easily we choose to live far below. Far below. And so we have expectations and disappointments and rejections and experiences and traumas and habits and history. And all that thing does is draw me down. It just pulls me down. But God says I live far above. And so I've decided this year I'm going to live far above language. And I realize that the only reason why people gossip is because they want to put other people down so that they can actually be lifted up high. I don't need to be lifted up high. I'm far above anyway. So I don't have to pull anybody down to lift myself up. I'm already far above. So that means everybody's reputation in my mouth and in my company is safe because I've chosen to live far above the systems of the world. The hope to which he has called you. That's what it says. Friends, this is, just keep your eyes closed. This is how Christians live. We live, I'm, 40, I'm 53 years old. We live with 53 years of history 
and about 18 months of future. What am I going to do? Where am I going to be? Where am I speaking? When are my holidays? 18 months. And we find ourselves somewhere in this 55-year bracket, and that's not where Christians should be living. Christians should be living between the present, right now, because my past has been dealt with by Jesus, with my anchor in heaven, with the hope of the calling of my future, that's where I should be living, and I should be living in that space the next 35 to 40 years, preparing myself for heaven, and when I live in that space, I become an incredibly beautiful person to hang around with. The Afrikaans have got a saying called Whippeloos. Hey, it's Whippeloos. Ek is nie whippeloos nie, want my Heere is in die hemel far above. And so I don't have to pull this whippeloosness of the economy. I don't have to pull this whippeloosness of alcohol. I don't have to pull this whippeloosness of my... And so many people that walk into my office are completely and utterly haunted by their past, carrying loads and... And, and weights and responsibilities of their race, of their trauma, of their rejection, of their abuse, it is dealt with by Jesus. And the church has got nothing else to offer except Jesus. Nothing else to offer. I can't offer you psychology. I can't offer you counseling. You know the problem with my preaching is it opens people's hearts and after every Sunday service, people come to me and say, I need to come and see you. Your 13 years of trouble cannot be fixed by six sessions in my office. Your 13 years of trouble can only be fixed by Jesus. Please, friends, you've got to understand that. And when you put Jesus at the center and you put your concerns at the periphery, you will start to get healed. We, we, we have allowed, as these schools which started in Christ, have allowed this diversity to creep into them. So the church has allowed psychology to creep into it and, the, and, and self-worth and identity. Friends, I have no identity except Christ. I don't have to brag. I don't have to boast. I don't have to build myself up. I don't have to sell myself to you. I am a ragamuffin that deserves hell. Jesus saved me. He called me to preach, and I have no other credential except that. Amen. I don't have 30 years of experience. That's not what qualifies me. Christ qualifies me. And every single day that I wake up, I need to draw on Christ. He is the vine. I am the branches. Without Him, I can do nothing. I was reading the book of Genesis the last couple of weeks, and in the Genesis of the four rivers, and a Christian environmentalist says this, God designed four rivers to flow into all four corners of the earth, and there would always be enough water supply the way God designed it, both through rain and through springs in the ground. But man decided cleverly to build dams so that he could have supply when there was drought. God never intended drought. God said there will always be rain and there will always be springs. But man decided to build dams. And when dams get built, the ecosystem goes on its head because wetlands disappear and everything below the dam wall gets distorted. And we are sitting and saying, God, floods and droughts. And where did it all come from? It came from man not trusting me because he built a dam because he didn't think I could be able to provide through the river. And this environment, says, if we broke every dam in the world now, within 18 months, the environment would turn around. It would be back to its original intention. We'd have rain when we had rain. We'd have spring when we had spring. We'd have winter when we had winter. And the earth would, but we won't do that because we don't trust God. And then we start building financial dams. And you don't have to trust God. Friends, God wants to be, he's our father. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be like, give me today my daily bread. He wants me to trust Him. But now we've got these dams that last for generations. Yes, I know you must leave an inheritance to your children's children. I know that. But where is your trust? Far above or far below? Where is your language? Far above or far below? Where are your relationships? Far above or far below. I said this in the evening meeting because it says the Father of glory or the glorious Father. We spoke last week. The Father of glory is the gracious and compassionate and slow to anger God. I said to my wife, sometimes 15 seconds of stupid talk can affect our, ho our houses for two weeks. You say things wrong in 15 seconds and for two weeks you try and sort the mess out. So I said, babe, give me a second chance. And only once this week. 
I said something, he said, she said to me, why don't you try that again? <laughs> Give him another chance. Give him another chance. Why don't you try it again? Sometimes you say things, let, let's be great, say, why don't you try that again? And what are we going to do? We're going to live far above. We're going to live far above. Not far below. How are we doing? Which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms. Far above. Say far above. Far above. above. All rule and authority, power and dominion and every title that can be given not only in the present age but also in the one to come. Far above every rule and authority. The Message Bible says, God put Jesus in charge of governments and galaxies. Let me show you a power video. Quickly, I think Ricky's got this one. Say incomparably great power. Come and stand here, Stephen, if you don't mind. Say incomparably great power. If I ran and tackled him, what chance has he got? <laughs> Say this with me, our Father who art in heaven. <laughs> Hallowed be your name. Keep your eyes closed. How far should I come from? How, what chance? Come, come, son, stand up. Yeah, just, just, just move that pulpit. No, no, no. Just move that pulpit. <laughs> Friend, we, we, we reduce our power source to what we know. Incomparably, just keep standing there. Incompar- you know, friends, this. If you get in the way of any human power source, you'll end up dead. If you get between the rocket launcher and the rocket, you die. You get in the way of the politics, you, 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 you protest against the government, you just disappear. The secret police just take you out. You disappear. Every form of human government which does not represent Christ will end up with dead people. But the Bible says... This incomparably great power that raised Jesus from the dead 
is available to us who believe. When you come under the power of Christ, you live. So if you take beast running or me running and hitting this guy, he has got no chance. So, so, so what happens when you put your childhood rejection here? What happens when you put your pornography problem here? What happens when you put your, my husband left you here? And in the natural you think, I'm going to run at him and I'm going to tackle him. In. How much more the incomparably great power of God? which somehow we don't tap into and we start to live lives below instead of living lives above. Maybe see it, Stephen. A man, a young man in England said he was standing on the veranda of his friend's house and he had bought his binoculars and he was looking out to sea and as he was looking out to sea, he was describing to his friend everything that he saw. The ships that he saw, the life that he saw, the weather that he saw, the waves that he saw. And then his friend's dad came home and he pulled out his telescope and he said to the young man, he said, look into this. And the young man looked into that and he said, I counted 25 ships that I'd never seen through my binoculars. You know what this text is saying? Lord, open the eyes of my heart. Put a telescope inside of my heart, Lord God, so that I might see 25 times more than I can see right now. Because I'm so limited through my experience. I'm so limited through my hurt. I'm so limited through my upbringing. I'm so limited through my religious history that I actually can't see what you've got planned for me. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord, so that I might see the hope to which you have called me, the riches of the inheritance and the saints, the incomparably great power for us who believe, and you will place me far above all principalities, powers, Amen. dominion, and authority. What has dominion over your life? What has dominion? Anything that controls you, controls your thoughts, controls your habits, controls your mind, controls your conversation. That's a dominion. That's a stronghold. That is an authority. And we have to have an encounter with God. How? It says like this, I pray that God might give you the spirit of wisdom, say wisdom, wisdom. and revelation, so that you might know. So we need to be wise about it. We've got to think about it. And we need revelation. That means we need something to bypass our natural abilities so we can see God properly, so we can start to live far above lives. Far, 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 far above lives. My son wants to play rugby for the Sharks. Yes, I know. Because Yammer, your haste is blow. <laughs> I mean, that's good. <laughs> My son wants to play rugby for the Sharks. That's all he wants to do. He's 17, he's 120 kgs. And this week alone, I've had four agents, one from Cape Town, one from Joburg, phone me and say, hey, Mr. Dyer, we want to sign your son. He's 17 years old. I'm going to sign my son for the rest. He's 17 years old. But I'm a Christian, and I have an inheritance in the saints, and I pray, and I live far above, and I don't have to go into the world of agencies and sign and countersign and write contracts. And so I just pray and say, God, please show me, help me, Lord God. How do we get him into the sharks without having to, the next 10 years of his life? And then this picture comes up. This picture comes up. On the left-hand side, is the CEO of the Sharks. Lucas House is the boarding establishment that my son is in. The CEO of the Sharks served God where? Well, in the church that I used to lead in Durban. And he met his wife there. And he got married there. And then he decided to send his son to the same school as my son and ended up in the same house 
as my son, I don't need agents. I just need to serve God. I just need to serve God. He'll, do all, he'll put it all together. You say, but it doesn't happen with me. No, just serve God. How? Three ways. Get to know Him better. Understand the hope of the calling that you have. Stop living in the past and start living in the future. I haven't got time to look there now, but Thessalonians says this. I put on the hope of salvation as a helmet. I've ridden motorbikes my whole life. My dad said, the first thing you do is you put on your? Say it? Exactly. You don't get on a motorbike until you put on your helmet. You don't get out of bed until you put your helmet on. And your helmet is the hope of salvation. I put it on. And the first thing I do is I bump into traffic. Then I bump into busyness. Then I bump into people. Then I listen to situations. Then somebody tells me, but it doesn't affect me because I've got the hope of salvation on my head. Then I have an inheritance in the saints where we sell one car from a lady in distress to a dealer. Where, 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 where the CEO of the Sharks ends up, he's going to come and watch his son play rugby and watch my son play rugby. And if my son is any good, I don't have to phone him. I didn't ask for his telephone number. Hey, Edward, it's Rory. By God's miracle, our sons have ended. I don't have to do that. I just have to go and watch my son play rugby. He's going to watch his son play rugby. And if my son is any good, he'll sign my son anyway. If he's not, it doesn't need my marketing ability. I haven't phoned him. I won't phone him. I will call him no favors. I will just serve God. And the incomparably, say incomparably, great power. Greater than a rocket. Great, can you imagine getting between two buffaloes as they hit each other like that? Can you imagine that power? Can you imagine putting your pornography problem between those two powers? And just going, bah! Explodes in a million pieces. Now imagine putting your pornography in the pathway of the incomparably great power of God. And we start to live... Say it. Say it. Not by human exertion, but by the finished work of Christ on the cross. Let's pray. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, your Bible says that I live above governments and I live above galaxies because of your finished work on the cross. Every human power taken to its end, Lord God, will lead to death, but the power of heaven defeated the greatest enemy in this world, which is death, and will give me life. I pray, Lord God, that if we have served God for one week or 30 years, that we would understand that we are not positioned far below with all the sources and resources and forces of this nature, but we are far above. We are far above economies. We are far above expectations. We are far above qualifications and disqualifications of men and of women. We are far above, Lord God. We are not defined, Lord God, by our lack or by our abundance, Lord God. We are defined by you. That is the only reason why rich men and young men and black men and white men and single men and young women and rich women and black women and white, it's the only reason why we can stand in the church with equality, Lord God. We don't need diversity policies. We just need to believe Jesus. We don't need transformation agendas. We just need to preach Jesus. And when we start to live far above, Lord God, our hearts will become so wide and so full and so life-giving that people would be attracted to us, God. I pray today that there would be a power encounter. How? By wisdom and revelation. There would be a power encounter with every dominion in this room, every form of government that holds your people bondage. And I want to tell you, friends, you've heard, there is religious bondage in some of your lives. You are being held by the dominion and the authority of your upbringing in the church. A man said to me at that party last night, if I leave this church, will I go to hell? I said, my friend, you can leave any church. If you believe in Jesus, you'll go to heaven. You can leave 3CR church. If you believe in Jesus, you'll go to heaven. 3CR doesn't get you to heaven. Jesus gets you to heaven. Any authority, any dominion, any power, 
any government that exists in any person here today. I pray, Father. I keep praying. I ask again. I keep asking. God, I plead with you. I cry out to you, Lord God. I intercede, Lord God, with you. That you would give these beautiful people the spirit of wisdom and revelation. So that that power would be broken. And your incomparable power would explode in their lives. So that we may find our address. When people say to you, what is your address? I say to them, far above. Far above. What is your language? Far above. What is your history? Far above. What is your nationality? Far above. What is your race? Far above. What is your gender? Far above. And I'm not going to let any system in this world pull me back down to earth. I'm going to live with hope and with riches and with power in an ever-increasing knowledge of God. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys.